good morning to the GMC main campus. Our 21st president, Lieutenant General William B. Cobble IV, our GMC main campus executive director, Colonel Nelson Kraft, the 144th Corps of Cadets, and of course our students, faculty, and staff of Georgia Military College, and greetings to all of those watching online. My name is Craig Portwood. I'm the director of alumni and community engagement here at GMC, and I have the very distinct honor of introducing our speaker this morning. Our speaker is retired Navy Captain Charlie Plum. He will tell you that he's just a farm kid from Kansas, but he graduated from the United States Naval Academy with an engineering degree, became a jet fighter pilot and a combat veteran with 74 successful missions over Vietnam. In addition, he helped start the Top Gun School in Miramar, California. On his 75th mission, just five days before he was scheduled to return home, Captain Plum was shot down over enemy territory. He ejected right out of his F-4 Phantom jet, parachuted into enemy hands, was taken prisoner, tortured, and survived nearly six years in communist prison camps. And he has returned to share his story of winning through adversity to more than 5,000 audiences in this country and around the world. And his military awards include the Silver Star, Bronze Star, two Purple Hearts, and the POW Medal. And for us to get a sense, a feel of how his story began, I direct your attention to the screen to watch this video. First prison cell I was in in Vietnam was eight feet long and eight feet wide. I remember distinctly the dimensions of that little cell. I could pace three steps in one direction before I ran into a wall. Then I had the opportunity of turning around and pacing three steps the other way. Inside of my new little home, I had nothing to do. I had no books to read, no windows to look out, no TV, telephone, Blackberry, Bluetooth. I didn't have a pencil or a piece of paper for 2,103 days.
to give you a better feel for that window of time, 2,103 days equates to age 24 to age 30 in my life. Turn your calendar ahead to the year 2028. Consider between today and 2028. The courses you'll take, deals you'll do, jobs you'll have, pretty good chunk out of a guy's life. Now, I've been a very active guy, like each of you, on the go, all the time, searching for an extra 15 minutes a week to call my mom. Suddenly, I had 24 hours a day for the next nearly six years. I'm describing this scenario to you somewhat semi-dramatically because I think the most value I can be to each of you. Regardless whether you're a cadet or a student, uh, regardless of whether you consider yourself a, a brother or a son or a sister, the most value I can be to you in the few minutes we're together is to invite you into my little prison cell. You see, there's a great deal to be learned in this little eight foot by eight foot box. So for the next few moments, I'd like for you to try your best to smell the stench of that two gallon bucket in the corner I call my toilet. I'd like you to try to feel the baking heat of a tropical summer in a tin roof prison cell 10,000 miles away from the good life. I'd like for you to try to taste the salt, the annoying taste of salt in the corners of your mouth and the sweat and the tears and the blood. Not that you'll ever be prisoners of war, God forbid. But if I do my job this morning, you'll see where the same kinds of challenges you and I face daily. In fact, maybe the biggest challenges that we face in our lives are the very same challenges I faced in that prison cell in Vietnam. More importantly, your response to the challenge that you face if you're going to succeed in this school and in life itself has to be the same recipe of response as I used over there just to survive. And one more thing. If this is already too great a stretch for you, if you're having trouble bridging this gap in time and geography between my experience and yours, the best I can offer you is an interesting war story. But here's a connect. Here's the touch point. Here, perhaps, is the reason your life and mine intersected today. There's not a person in this auditorium who has not, in the last few weeks or months, felt overwhelmed and underappreciated. Through these years of COVID, there's not a person here who hasn't felt inadequate for the task, or lonely, or afraid. Not a person here who hasn't had trouble communicating, even with those you love the most. So once you get the hang of this, put aside your comfort zone just for a little bit. won't hurt much. Step into a, dig a dingy little prison cell a long way from home. And when you have the feel of this, I have a couple of questions I want to ask. And I want your answers to my questions in a bit. Here's the first one. How do you survive this? What kind of stuff do you have in your gut? What did you bring to breakfast this morning? What kind of tools do you have in your psychological toolbox you'd pull out and apply to a problem like this? Question number two, leaders. And I know some of you don't wear any rank, but you're all leaders. If you're affecting the people around you, by definition, you're a leader. Leaders? What about the guys next door? What about those fighter pilot prisoners of war in that cell next to yours, guys that are clinging to life by their fingernails or in a world of hurt, they need your help, but they don't trust you. How do you get through to them? Well, the first thing you learn in a prison cell is pain. You probably guess that part. This hurts. This hurts a whole lot. But the second thing, you might not suspect this part. The second thing you learn in a prison cell is, well, the minutes eventually wear into hours. The hours eventually wear into days. I mean, it takes forever for the first day or two, the, the, uh, eventually a week, and then a month, and then a year, and you acclimate. You get used to this. In fact, you get so comfortable in your little eight-foot-by-eight-foot eight prison cell that the last place you want to go is outside the cell because it's dark and lonely out here. At least you know the devil in the light. Here's what happens you get this restriction built up. And it's not the eight feet between the walls. It's the eight inches between your ears. You're in this mental box. 
Ever been in one of those mental boxes? Yeah, we all get there. I'm convinced the mental boxes of our lives can be more restrictive than those walls of stone and steel that I was behind. But I don't mind telling you this. It didn't take me very many miles. At three steps by three steps, I was going nuts. Finally, I decided, Charlie, if you're going to survive this, you're going to have to get a little creative, come up with something to do physically and mentally. Keep your mind and your body sharp. That's what I'll do. I'll make a little deck of cards, and I did. I constructed a little deck of playing cards about the size of postage stamps. I tore these cards from 52 little strips of toilet paper. And I can tell you this with authority. Toilet paper is tough to shuffle. <laughs> you don't lick your fingers very much shuffling toilet paper. OK, before we get into your answers to my questions, let me tell you what respect I have just to be back at Georgia Military College. Uh, I really believe in who you are and what you do. And I think that if we could duplicate this school and the attitude that goes on here and the patriotism and the dedication all across the country, we'd be a better place to live. Back to my questions. I'm going to write your answers down on this flip chart. Question is, what qualities do you have within you that you would pull out to survive six years in a prison camp? What tools do you have in your psychological toolbox you would pull out to survive this? I need a long list. Just shout it out. Tell me something. Perseverance and confidence. Is that what you said? Great. All right, need a long list. What else? Faith. I heard that. Faith in what? Faith in God, of course. Faith in what else? Yourself. Yourself. In your country. All right. What else? Grit. Grit, for sure. Need a few more. Yes. Strength. I'm sorry? Tenacity. Tenacity. Great. Got room for two more. I'm sorry? Patience. One more. Sorry? Imagination. Great. All right, what a list. Your words, not mine. I'm just a scribe. To survive in a prison camp, we need perseverance, confidence, faith in God, yourself, your country, grit, strength, tenacity, patience, imagination. Let me ask you this. Where'd you get this stuff? Where, where did you get your confidence? Where does confidence come from? Where did you get your grit? How about tenacity or patience or imagination? Did you learn, learn this stuff on a computer? In a book? Uh-uh. <laughs> Let me ask you another question. How do you measure this stuff? Tell me how you measure the value of grit. Uh, put a yardstick on perseverance. How about confidence or patience or tenacity or imagination? You give me a, a, a list of qualities that you can't learn in a textbook and you can't measure with a yardstick. And yet, we are here <laughs> at GMC. And that's what we do, right? We learn things. We learn to measure things. If you can't measure it, it doesn't exist, right? I guess my point, in, and I don't mean in any way to diminish your education. You have, to, you have to have your education. That's vital. That's a baseline, OK? All I'm saying is this, in life itself, the things that you will need to overcome the challenge that you face will be perseverance and confidence and faith and grit and strength and tenacity and patience and imagination. 
I call these the panels in your parachute. Let me explain that. Several years after I came home from Vietnam, I was in a restaurant in Kansas City where I used to live. About two tables over, a guy kept looking at me. I didn't recognize this gent. He stood up. The guy walked over to my table. He pointed at me with a very stern look on his face. He said, you're Captain Plum. I looked up and I said, yes, sir. I'm Captain Plum. You're that guy. You're that guy. He said, you, you flew jet fighters in Vietnam. Part of that top gun outfit. You were shot down off the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk. You parachuted in enemy hands, you were tortured, you spent six years as a prisoner of war. I looked up at this guy and I said, how in the world did you know all that? He finally broke into a smile and as he said, because I packed your parachute. Tell you this, when this guy runs around the country making speeches, suddenly I was speechless. The best I could do was stagger to my feet, reach out a very grateful hand of thanks. He came up with just the proper words. The guy grabbed my hand, he pumped my arm, and he said, I guess it worked. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, sir, indeed it did. And, and I must tell you, I've said a lot of prayers of thanks for your nimble fingers, but I had no idea I'd ever had the opportunity of expressing my gratitude in person. He said, were all the panels there? I said, I must be honest with you, that they, they weren't. Of the 18 panels I was supposed to have in that parachute, had only 15 good ones. Three of the panels were torn, but it wasn't your fault. It was mine. I ejected from that F-4 Phantom jet at 600 knots close to the ground. I was well outside the envelope of that parachute. You did your job. I didn't do mine. I said, but let me ask you a question. Do you, um, do you keep track of all the parachutes you pack? Do you know of all the lives you've saved like mine? And I said, no. Now, this is the most important part of the conversation that night, maybe the most important thing I say this morning, and I think it deals directly with duty, honor, country. I think it deals directly with character above all. Here's what he said. He said, no, I don't keep track of all the parachutes I pack. It's enough gratification for me just to know that I've served just to know that I've helped somebody out long life's rocky road. Hey, gang, isn't that what life's about? Isn't that the purpose <laughs> that God putting you on this globe is to serve other people? Isn't that what this school is about? Whether you're going to be in the military or civilian, as a parent, as a citizen. So, Question becomes, how's your parachute packing coming along? Who is it that looks to you for that kind of strength in time of need? Maybe more importantly, how's your parachute packed? Who, uh, who do you look to in trying times? Well, mine was pretty well packed. My physical parachute, 15 of 18, that was enough for a safe descent. My mental parachute, if you will, had the skills of my craft, okay? had the knowledge, I have an engineering degree, a naval officer, fighter pilot. My emotional parachute, pretty stable guy. My spiritual parachute, I knew the Lord. Got my parachute packed, same place you did, early in life. I grew up in a tiny town in Kansas. 325 souls in this little town and a couple of Presbyterians. <laughs> Love that little town. I was a rich kid. Filthy rich I was. <laughs> Didn't have any material wealth, didn't have running water, didn't have an indoor toilet until I was seven years old. But we were rich in family unity and love and had a great childhood. I was a Boy Scout and I threw the newspaper. Got my parachute packed. Don't miss the metaphor. People gave of themselves, asking nothing in return. See, parachute packing is not a trade. It's not, I'm going to do this for you if you do that for me. That's the mistake that people make. Parachute packing is unconditional. Sometimes it's secret. Sometimes they don't know that you're helping them out, and it's okay. So the parachute packers in that little town, of course, mom and dad and big sister, two little brothers, and a coach, I'll never forget, named Smith. If Clarence Smith were still alive, I would have called him this morning to thank that guy for packing my parachute. Thank him 
for giving me some of those nuggets I was going to need when I go and got tough. He was a veteran. This guy had shrapnel on his leg from his war, but he was our coach. Ragtag basketball. We lost and lost and lost. The last game of the season, we lost again. Imagine, one dejected 13-year-old kid wandering off to the locker room, head hung low, and here comes the coach. He, he, he walked with a limp, okay? but he caught up with me. And I felt his arm over my sweaty shoulder. And I looked at the coach, tough disciplinarian, and all I could think of to say was, I'm sorry, coach, I guess this team's just a bunch of losers. And the coach squeezed my shoulder, and he sunk his fingernails into the flesh. He was about to say something he didn't want me to forget. He said, son, whether you think you're a loser or whether you think you're a winner, you're right. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> I asked him the next day at school, Coach, what did that mean? He said, just, he said, life is a choice. Every day of your life is going to be a beautiful choice. I don't care where you go, he said. I don't care what kind of a scrape you get yourself into someday. I don't know how he had that kind of premonition, unless it was the way I played basketball. <laughs> he said, you can choose every day. You can choose happiness or sadness. You can choose a smile or a frown. That's a choice. You can choose health or sickness. You can choose life or death. He said, there's one more choice. When the going is tough and the margins are thin and the competition is high and you're all out of ideas, you can always choose to give away all those other choices. You can absolutely elect to step back and become the victim or you can step forward and become the victor. It's your choice. He said, but I don't want you coming back here in four or five years and belly aching at me because you flunked out of high school because you couldn't stand those teachers and they were always picking on you. I don't want you coming back here in eight or 10 years tell me they got this job but you couldn't, you couldn't stand the supervisor because he was too mean to you. I don't want you coming back here in 20 years tell me you married this gal and she turned off bad and you had to divorce her because that she was the reason you failed. He said, because the truth is the difference between success and failure in your life is not the things around you. It's the choices you make about the things around you, and you can choose to be a winner, you can choose to be a loser, and you can choose to give away the choice. Now, with that kind of inspiration and motivation, as you might suspect, I graduated from that little grade school top of my class of two. <clears throat> and the other guy wasn't all that bright. <laughs> you know, you get yourself into trouble on the speaking circuit. I was still living in Kansas City. I got a frantic call from Topeka, Kansas. Superintendent of schools out there. He said, Charlie, I got a problem. Can you help? I said, I'll try. Well, I got this in-service meeting, 350 teachers. My speaker just canceled. Breakneck speed, Topeka, Kansas. Just on, on a stage, just like this, facing 350 teachers. Started to tell my story. Folks, I feel right at, at home here in Topeka. I grew up right down the river there in Lake Compton, Kansas, and I graduated from that little grade school, top of my class of two. Some of them laughed. I said, and the other guy wasn't all that bright. A few more of them laughed. I looked at, about halfway out in the crowd. Here's the number two guy. Right, right there. <laughs> <laughs> and he won't let me forget that. <laughs> I don't know how smart you were at age 17. Some of you are only barely over 17. I uh, I was a hayseed from Kansas. Never been out of the four states of Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, Iowa. Never seen the ocean. Never ridden in an airplane at age 17. What I did know was I need an education. My parents couldn't afford to send me to college. I started looking around for scholarships. Did the old shotgun approach. I sent my resume to everybody I could think of. I got an appointment to Annapolis. Unbelievable. <laughs> I had no idea what they did in Annapolis. I really didn't. <laughs> I, I, I'd, I'd like to stand here and tell you, you know, I had these great dreams and goals of being an admiral someday, flying airplanes someday, commanding fleets, but it wasn't true. I went to Annapolis because it was a free school. And I had no idea what I was getting into. 
So I got on that Greyhound bus in Kansas City, Kansas, and two days later I was pledging to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I had no idea what it was going to take to fulfill that commitment. My first year, and some of the plebes in the class will understand this, was terrible. <laughs> they cut my hair. <laughs> they do that to you? <laughs> they made me get up early in the morning. <laughs> Oh, wow, what a deal. Um, they taught me to march, okay, and polish shoes. <laughs> uh, and it, there was never enough time. I remember the plebe year at the Naval Academy. I, I, I searched for an extra three or four minutes a day just to do something I wanted to do instead of something everybody else was telling me to do. But I got a degree there. I learned a lot, learned to tie knots in the Morse code, drive the ships around the Chesapeake Bay, and lucky for me, I got my parachute packed at Annapolis. Don't miss the metaphor. People gave of themselves, asking nothing in return. See, parachute packing is not a trade. It's not, I'm going to do this for you if you'll do that for me. It's a gift. It's unconditional. They had a lot of parachute packers at the Naval Academy, and they were chaplains and other midshipmen and professors and instructors and the superintendent, Admiral Charles Kirkpatrick. This guy had gold from his wrist all the way up to his shoulder, and he'd stand up in front of the big pep rallies before the football games, and you could, you, you, you could see the veins running his brow as he would clench his fist and tell the team and the brigade, you guys can do anything you set your minds to do. Hype? Messing with our minds? Mental manipulation. Did it work? Those four years, the Naval Academy produced two Heisman Trophy winners in four years. Amazing. Roger Staubach, Joe Bellino. I was there, watched them both play. We were the number two, number one college team in the nation for a while because he told us we could do anything we set our minds to do. Uh, interesting stories there, Captain. What's it got to do with being a cadet? What's it got to do with uh, being in a junior college? Uh, what's the point here? Just this. I was empowered by both those guys, okay? Both the coach and the superintendent empowered me. They empowered me to win, which was beautiful. More importantly, they empowered me to fail. Did you get that part? Life is a choice, said the coach. You can do anything you set your... Those are positive or negative. You can take those issues either way. They empowered me to win. They empowered me to fail. Most importantly, they empowered me to make my choice between the two. And so it is in your life. So it is in this school. Look what you've got. Look at the opportunities here. You won the lottery just, just because you're a a cadet or a student here. Look at the leadership. Okay, look at that technology. Look at the training. Look, 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 look at all the reasons, okay, you are empowered to succeed. Now let's also admit it. You're empowered to fail as well. And most importantly, you're empowered to make the choice between the two. When I get on my knees at night and pray for this nation, I think one of the big problems we have is that we won't let people fail. You know, I don't know, you, you, you were in high school and, 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 and grade school, and did they teach, did they uh, uh, keep score in your soccer games? Uh, so so, so we, give a, we give a prize to everybody that comes through here, and then they get out in real life and find out that, man, you can fail. And it's okay. It's okay to fail, right? You just learn from the failure. So with that, I graduated from Annapolis. Now, from that school, I didn't graduate top of my class. In fact, from the Naval Academy, I graduated in the half of the class that made the top half possible. <laughs> no, it was a dirty job, and somebody had, I threw that hat in the air, pin on those officer bars. What a proud day in my life when I married my high school sweetheart. Lovely blonde girl from Kansas, under the arch of swords, came down from the chapel right straight to flight training, Pensacola, Florida, Beeville, Texas, Meridian, Mississippi, where John McCain was my flight instructor. He taught me to fly jets. After the Miramar 
in California where I flew the first advers adversarial flights for the Top Gun School. Many of you have seen Top Gun and Maverick, and let me tell you how the school really got started. <laughs> I showed up at Miramar with my buddy Paul Krukey. We had been designed, uh, assigned the F-4 Phantom Jet, hottest airplane in the world at the, at the time, Mach 2.2. We could go over twice the speed of sound. Amazing airplane, top of the line. The bad news was there was a six-month wait. There was a pool of students ahead of us, and we couldn't fly this airplane. Now, we just had our wings of gold, and we wanted to fly, so we wandered down the flight line. We found a squadron down there. It was Instrument Training Squadron, flying F-9 Cougars. Now, we'd flown those in flight training, and so we knew how we were qualified to fly this Cougar. It's a little jet. It's not very fast. It's not very big. But we signed on to take these students. And uh, instrument training is really boring. Okay, You're under this bag, and you're looking at your instruments, and, and you're just kind of tooling around the sky. And so Paul and I would save a few hundred pounds of jet fuel every day. We would lurk off the coast of San Diego. When the phantoms came off the runway at Miramar, we would pounce on these guys. Totally illegal. We weren't supposed to be doing this. Okay? We weren't supposed to be dogfighting with the phantoms. As a high-altitude supersonic interceptor, the, the Phantom pilots were not trained to dogfight. It was the Cold War. We thought that our, that our adversary was going to be Russian bombers. And, and so I was trained, I, I was trained in, in, in a space suit so I could go above 50,000 feet. You know, big helmet and, and, and uh, carry it around an uh, uh, air conditioner in my briefcase. And, and that's the way I trained. I didn't, wasn't trained to dogfight. So Paul and I would, off the coast, and we would pounce on these guys, and we would wipe them out every time. Until one day, we came back to the ready room on the bulletin board and said, Plum and Krukey report to the commanding officer of the F-4 squadron immediately. So here's two 23-year-old guys, okay? Sweaty flight suits, blood, <laughs> bloody eyeballs, because that's what happens to you when you pull a lot of Gs. <laughs> and we're knocking on the door. Uh, the commanding officer of the F-4 squadron. Come in. And so we opened the door, and there he was, sitting at this, this wooden desk, and he's looking over the top of his glasses. Old guy, you know, 32, 33. <laughs> <laughs> he was in a sweaty flight suit also, okay, which should have been our first indicator. He looked at us, he said, you the two guys in the F-9s out there today? Uh, y y yes, sir, we were. Did you... Uh, did you follow a phantom through an entire loop? Um, yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Did you have your guns trained on that phantom the entire time? Yes, sir, we sure did. Do you know who was in that phantom? We thought we were toast. <laughs> we thought he was, was going to pull our wings immediately. He said, I just came back from Vietnam. You guys looked an awful lot like MiGs in Vietnam, and I, I, and I can tell you, uh, our kill ratio is terrible. They're eating our lunch. You want to come back tomorrow and teach us how to dogfight? That's how Top Gun got started. Paul Krukey and I, for the next six months, you know, we put on our, 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 our white scarves and our Snoopy goggles, and we went out there fighting the F-4s in these little F-9 cougars, and it worked. The kill ratio turned around because of Top Gun. We found that, yes, you can fight this airplane, the F-4, but oh, by the way, it took some special training to do it. So I launched on the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk. Imagine, 24 years old, okay, in command of a multi-gazillion dollar fighter. See this hand? I have two throttles in the hand. I shove these throttles into the afterburners. I can go 1,400 miles an hour, and that's a long way from the old John Deere tractor. <laughs> See this finger? Pull the trigger on my control stick, release the missiles from underneath my wings. I can knock down enemy airplanes I can't even see. I really am the top gun. I am the best of the best. I'm the guy that always stands tall. I'm the one that's never afraid. Hey, hey, I'm probably bulletproof. How about it? Ever feel bulletproof? Did you feel bulletproof before you flunked that math test? <laughs> Uh, or before that friend of yours didn't turn out to be very trustworthy. It's okay to have positive attitudes. I totally believe in thinking positively, but when you start getting cocky, 
when you start believing you're self-made and you don't need any help from anybody else, when you start feeling bulletproof, here's the advice. Check your six o'clock position. You got a missile sneaking up your tail. We were hit. A SAM, S-A-M, surface-to-air missile, exploded with some 12,000 pounds of jet fuel. This is a big airplane. It would bar barely fit in this room. Exploded with some 12,000 pounds of jet fuel. It sent that bird topsy-turvy end over end down towards that rice paddy below. I ejected. My co-pilot ejected. Our parachutes opened, and we came floating down over enemy territory. Ever been in one of those parachutes? Don't mean the nylon ones. I'm talking about the parachutes of life. That's what this discussion is about. The little fender benders that we all get ourselves into once in a while. But really, isn't that where your value lies? Let's try to measure it. Okay, hypothetically, let's measure the value of you. What are you worth? What are you worth to this school? What are you worth to your family? What are you worth to your God? You see, it can't be measured in the easy times. That's not fair. Anybody can log on. Anybody can answer the phone. Your true value has to be measured when the heat's on, when things are tough, when you don't know the answer, and you're confused, and you want to quit. Or let's turn the coin over. What if? Let's play. What if you had the perfect world? What, what if everybody said yes to all your great ideas? Would you be as good as you are today? Would you uh, prepare that uniform as well? Would you get up as early? Um, would you be as proactive? Would, would we even be at this school in this auditorium if we had no challenges in life? Here's the point. Hang in there. You're not going to believe it. I think I can prove it to you. Here's the point. There's great value in getting blown out of the sky once in a while. There's great value in that wake-up call. You know the one that you and I want to roll over and ignore? The wake-up call that forces us to re-examine the way we're living our lives. If that's true, the next question is real easy. Yeah, but, yeah, but, Captain, <laughs> how do you turn it around? Uh, get all this negative stuff falling on my head. How do I take this energy and refocus it to something positive? I don't know. I, I don't know how you do it. All I can tell you is how I did it. I felt the opening shock of the parachute. As I had been trained as a fighter pilot, I immediately looked up and I counted the panels in my parachute. That technique is called assessing your support group. I looked down at the unknown, the future. <laughs> They're shooting at me. The audacity of, don't they know I'm the top gun? <laughs> Haven't they read the newspaper? Don't they know about me? <laughs> Look, they just knocked down my multi-gazillion dollar airplane, and now they're shooting at the pilot. And I'll tell you this. Now, you can identify with this one. When you're dodging bullets, it's tough to come up with a long-range plan. <laughs> so how do you do it? I don't know. All I can tell you is how I did it. I took a deep breath, like that gunny sergeant taught me on the rifle range. Before I pull the trigger, I gotta calm myself. I let about half of that breath out, and I bowed my head, and I said a prayer. I asked for a little extra strength that day from above. Never forget that prayer. Thought about that prayer a lot over those next six years in those various prison cells. Thought back to that moment in time, and I would say to myself, "Well, dummy, why didn't you make a deal with God?" Promise to be a righteous, sober, godly guy the rest of my life, and all I need from you, Lord, is a little wind. 10, 12 knots, gusting to 40, please. <laughs> I guess I didn't feel in much of a negotiable position. So I just prayed for the guts it was going to take to survive. I knew there was going to be some pain involved in my future. I prayed there might be some value in the pain. Then I prayed for my wife. Remember her? See, this was my war, not hers. And yet, at the end of the Vietnam War, that sweet little lady would feel, felt, would feel more pain from that war than I did. Tough on families. Tough. So I hit the ground. Something about waist deep in a rice paddy. Uh, I was uh, attacked by 
uh, I don't know, it seemed like 20 or 30 of the villagers. Um, they stripped me of everything I had. They took my flight gear, my clothing, my personal possessions. They even took my name, gave me a name from their language just to humiliate me for the next nearly six years. Dragged me around village to village, camp to camp, tortured for two days with ropes and irons and whips. And that's when they tossed me into this little cell. The one I described to you from the very beginning, that little eight by eight, never forget that cell. So let me tell you about my physical state those first few months in that prison. I was bleeding from four open wounds. I had four holes in my, my skin where blood's running out. No medical care at all. Um, I'm getting really skinny, surviving on two bowls of rice and some broth every day. And thirsty, they gave us a liter of water for a day in the summertime. That wasn't nearly enough, especially for the big guys. I, was, I had these boils all over my body. We never knew exactly where they came from, but every fighter pilot shot down in the summertime was covered with boils. I'm getting real skinny, maybe 130 pounds, and that was my physical state. And that was the good news. The bad news was my mental state. I had surrendered. I had given up. Fighter pilots are not supposed to give up. Not in our training, not in our DNA, okay? And I felt very guilty about that. I, 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 how can I ever go back to my country and, and, and face my fellow fighter pilots? Uh, how, can, how can I face my family and admit to them I had failed in my mission so miserably? Maybe I won't. Maybe I won't go back. Maybe I'll go to some foreign country at the end of this war and change my name and, and live the rest of my life trying to forget that misery and pain. So that's my mindset, okay? And I'm pacing this floor, and I, I heard in the far corner the chirping noise of a cricket. Paid no attention at first, yet the longer I listened, the more rhythmic this sound became. It was like a snare drum. I walked over to the corner of my prison cell to check it out. In the corner of my cell, there was no cricket but a little piece of wire about that long poked through a hole at the base of the cell wall and scratching on my concrete floor, making this chirping noise like a cricket. Are you with me? Can you imagine what might be going through your mind in a situation like this? I I'm watching a little wire. I'm thinking to myself, the enemy is not sophisticated enough to try to trick me like this. It's not the enemy. On the other end of that wire has to be another American. And if it's American... It also has to be a fighter pilot. Since that's who's in these prison camps. This is an air war. We're being shot down. We got a prison camp full of fighter pilots. And boy, would I like to talk to another fighter pilot. Man, can we tell some stories? But, but I'll bet that guy's tougher than I am. He's probably older. He's probably smarter. He's probably a better pilot. And he probably didn't cry for mercy when they tortured him like I did. I'm losing interest in communicating. Ever get that way? I mean, when you really get down in the dumps, you know, when you failed at something and, and you don't want to admit your failure. And I'm thinking, I, I, I don't need to talk to anybody else. In fact, if I can just crawl over here in the corner of this prison cell and wait, surely in three or four years, the war will end. They'll break down the gates. I'll be set free. I'll never have to take another risk for the rest of my life. And the wire kept scratching, and I kept sweating. And finally, finally, I got up the guts to reach down, grab the little wire, and tug. And the wire tugged back. I tugged again, and it disappeared right back through that rat hole. The wire came back about an hour later. This time, the wire had a little note wrapped around the end of it. The note was written on a dirty piece of toilet paper. I unfolded it very carefully. It was in English, and here's what it said. It was the alphabet. It was a five by five matrix of the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. What letter did I leave out? K. Numbers down the side and across the top, 
indicating any letter of the alphabet would be represented by two numbers. Number of the line, uh, the number of the of the row, then the number of the line. Uh, we substituted C for a K to make it come out five by five. So A, first line, first row, one tug, one more tug. Got it? Z, fifth line. Fi you think your email is cumbersome. <laughs> you try this. But it worked. This silly, archaic, cumbersome code became our language. More than that, it became our lifeblood. It was absolutely vital. I mean, life and death vital that we communicate with the other prisoners of war. Oh, here's the interesting part. It wasn't the words we were forming with these letters. It wasn't the top secret escape plans, okay, that we were passing around. The life-saving property of communication in a prison camp and in this college is the simple validation of another human being. Because in those prison camps, when it was dark, and it was in a lot of the camps, you couldn't tell green from red, and you were alone. Some guys were in solitary confinement for four and a half years. If it was dark and you were alone, it seems like you'd lose track. You wouldn't know what's a, a memory, what's a hallucination. You'd need a baseline. You need a sounding board. You need to validate your sanity. Sometimes you didn't know if you were alive or dead. The simple tugging on a wire, to have that wire tugged back meant two things. Number one, somebody's responding to something I am doing physically, thus I exist. Number two, somebody cares. In this day and age, you and I would probably argue that the greatest achievement of all times, we can now pass a packet of data from one handheld machine to another at lightning speed. I'm still here to, to suggest to you that the very essence of life is validating other people. It's the old adage, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. On the other end of the wire, Lieutenant Commander Bob Shoemaker, fighter pilot extraordinaire. Astronaut Kennedy, the guy had orders to NASA before he was shot down. He'd been there for two years when I got there. Total of eight, over eight years, Bob Shoemaker. Amazing, amazing. He had been piecing the together little bits of wire, stuffing them out a hole in his cell wall and across a storeroom. There was a storeroom between our two prison cells. He fished that wire over the boxes and around the shovels and through the ropes and into the little hole in my cell wall, 14 feet away. Unbelievable. Just to contact me. Just to pack my parachute. He said, plumber. That was my call sign, plumber. I, I could have been maverick. You know, <laughs> plumber, who calls somebody plumber? <laughs> plumber, you've just joined the finest team you'll ever play on. He said, we have leadership in this prison camp that will be the best you will ever see, bar none, for the rest of your life. Our leaders have turned this thing around. Jim Stockdale, Jeremiah Denton, John McCain, they tell us we're not on the defensive. I'm looking around in that prison cell, <laughs> thinking to myself, I'm not on the defensive. We are on the offensive. We are warriors. We will pursue this war till our last dying breath, so pull up your big boy pants. Let's get on with it. Whew. Man, turn the whole thing around, and it worked. It worked. I, I didn't believe it at the time. I'm a junior officer, okay? I'm thinking, oh, yeah, the brass down in the in-cell block, man, they're, they're coming to all these rules, you know? What are they going to do, pull my liberty card, <laughs> restrict my vacation? <laughs> but it worked. A study was done just four or five years ago about all the combatants of Vietnam. 30.6% have post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, you know what it is. Of the prisoners of war, 4% of us have PTSD. And it's primarily the guys shot down near the end of the war were only prisoners for a week or two or a month. They're the ones with the mental issues. In fact, they've come up with a new term called PTG, post-traumatic growth. And we're the poster boys for post-traumatic growth for what we've done. They thought we'd be 
they thought we'd be zombies when we came home. They thought we'd be in baskets. They had our families briefed to institutionalize us for the rest of our lives. And we've proven that you can go through any hardship in life, okay, if you make the right choices. You use those hardships as stepping stones towards your success. But the leaders in, the, in that prison camp were all the guys with the, uh, with the eagles and the, and, and the oak leaves. In fact, maybe the best parachute packer in the prison camp turned out to be a Navy sailor, an enlisted guy. Uh, wait a minute, Captain, you just told us that you were all fighter pilots and uh, college graduates and upper class. How did a Navy sailor get into a prison camp in an air war over North Vietnam? Well, he fell off his ship. <laughs> he used to tell us, I wasn't captured, I was rescued. <laughs> and he was. <laughs> 19 years old, Seaman Douglas Hegel <laughs> fell off the cruiser Canberra in the middle of the night. <laughs> Could he take a joke? <laughs> Washed ashore, captured. No, no, no. You know, you know, you know. So, so we're, we're, we're tugging on the wires and tapping on the walls in a secret code, all right? Who's the oldest in the prison camp? Who's got the most kids back home? Just for something to do. Who's been here the longest? One time we had what we called the high fast, the low slow contest, to try to determine what fighter pilot had jumped out of his jet going highest and fastest, who jumped out going lowest and slowest. High fast was won by some Air Force jock who punched out of his F-105 at 52,000 feet, 1,000 miles an hour. And the low slow contest was won by the Navy sailor. <laughs> 12 feet at 15 knots right there <laughs> oh but here's the interesting part and why I take your valuable time to tell you the story this uh, lowly sailor this insignificant interlevel minimum wage new hire part you know what I'm talking about plebes <laughs> didn't seem to suffer from this 8 inch box he didn't have a bad case you know of his prison thinking. What did he do? He set to work. He got into action. He took a risk. He got further outside his comfort zone, kicked it all down, started tugging on wires and tapping on walls. He collected our names. 254 men in that prison camp, and he memorized our names, put our names into songs. He would sing these songs over and over until he finally got them all. Went back through the list. He memorized our social security number or identifier. 254 long numbers. He memorized this stuff. He'd, he would study his list six or eight or ten hours a day. He had nothing else to do. Still wasn't finished. Memorized our next of kin, wives and fathers, their hometowns all across the country. I'm not kidding you. Doug Hagel memorized the telephone numbers of each of the relatives of each of the prisoners. That took two years. Things were getting better. The enemy was getting a lot of pressure from around the world to stop torturing their prisoners. And, and, and in fact, they decided, we're going to send some guys home early before the end of the war as proof of our lenient and humane treatment. First guy they went to was John McCain, my old flight instructor. They said, McCain, we're sending you home early before the end of the war. At the time, his father was Sink Pat, commander-in-chief of the Pacific. John's dad was in charge of the Vietnam War when John and I were prisoners. So John said, in your dreams you're sending me home early. I would never embarrass my father by doing that. I'd never give up on my buddies that need American medical aid more than I. Send you take your idea and shove it. And he got into a lot of trouble doing that. So they're still looking for someone. And our senior man sent the message to the sailor. Son, I want you to volunteer to go home first. The sailor sent back, sir, with all due respect, I would rather stay here with the team. I want to march out of here with you guys. I want to be a part of the solution. I, uh, <laughs> Our senior man said, that's not an option. Here's the direct order. Shove off. The sailor said, aye, aye, sir. Home he came. Now write the script on the sailor. What would you expect? 21 years old, in prison for two years, starved, humiliated, lonely, tortured, Hasn't seen a woman in two years, but things are looking up. He suddenly has a brand new suit of clothes on, two years back pay in his pocket, and he's free on the streets of Atlanta. What can you expect? Oh, but he was a parachute packer. What do you suppose he did? 
Sure, he started to travel west coast to east, north to south. He went through each one of the hometowns he memorized. He dialed each one of those telephone numbers he memorized. He spoke to each one of the wives he memorized, told her that her husband was alive. So let me ask you this question. Do you know any of those folks I'm talking about, those parachute packers? Let me give you a hint. The school is full of them. Gang, you absolutely won the lottery being right here at GMC. Look what you got. Look at the training. Look at the leadership. Look at the technology. Look at the, the it, I wish we could duplicate this school all over the country. So in the very first conversation with Bob Shoemaker, he said, our leadership has a motto here. It's easy. It's three words. I said, OK, what's the motto? He said, here's the motto, return with honor. He said, every decision you make, you see through the prism of return with honor. We commissioned a ship after Jim Stockdale, who was our leader over there. It's called the USS Stockdale. My wife and, uh, my, and one of my sons was on that ship. We, we, we were on there for two days as we took the ship from San Diego up to Port Wyneme to commission the ship. And I spoke to the crew about Jim Stockdale, because I had been his communications officer. I knew him pretty well. And return with honor. And if you see that destroyer, you will see right on the bow, USS Stockdale, return with honor. I know you know those terms. That's what we live by here. You'll see at the Naval Academy as well. The, the, the gate number one at the Naval Academy, return with honor. That's... That's the spirit, okay? That's, that's what you learn. That, 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 that's the stuff that you're made of. So the war finally ended, and uh, we traded prisoners, 10,000 of the bad guys for 591 of us. Got on a big airplane and flew back into Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. I ran down the ladder of that airplane across the tarmac to the first telephone I could find to call. Remember her? I had that first conversation totally memorized, but she was gone. I called my parents back in Kansas. What has happened to my wife? And my dad couldn't. He was so broken up he couldn't talk to me. My mother, my mother finally said, son, I'd give 10 years of my life if I didn't have to tell you this. I think she would have. Your wife hung on for five years, and then just three months ago, she filed for divorce. She's engaged to be married to another guy. So I'm curled up in a fetal position in the hospital room at Great Lakes Naval Hospital near Chicago. I'm thinking to myself, oh, woe is me. What could be worse than this? This is so terrible, but it's not my fault. I'm the victim of circumstances beyond. Wait a minute, you hypocrite. Pull up your big boy pants. We've got a life to live. And so I did. And so did the other guys. We are setting records, the prisoners of war from Vietnam. 591 of us, and they thought we'd be in baskets. We've produced 17 generals and seven admirals in the military. No group in history has ever done this. Most of us retired as senior grade military officers. We went back to commanding ships and fleets and flying airplanes, as I did, all over the, all over the world. We have doctors and lawyers and preachers and teachers and bishops and judges and mayors. We have a bunch of congressmen, two United States senators, a vice president to Canada, a president to Canada, a governor, two ambassadors. They're telling us today we're healthier mentally and physically than if we hadn't been shot down. Figure that out. So the psychiatrists and psychologists that know more about this than I do say it was because of the leadership we had there. It was because of the duty, honor, country. It was because of the return with honor. It's the stuff that the leaders passed down to us that built a, the team as good as you'll ever, uh, you'll ever play on. Shoemaker, on the end of the wire, remember him? Two-star admiral today. My backseater, my co-pilot, came back to the States, went back to flying Navy jets off aircraft carriers. Some guys never learn. <laughs> now, that's not fair. I continued to fly for the Navy, and I have two little airplanes of my own that I fly today. Uh, who else did I tell you about? Oh, the kid that memorized the names, the sailor. He's a teacher, still packing those parachutes. My wife married the guy she was engaged to. They're living happily ever after I remarried a wonderful lady. We have four kids and four grandkids and live 
a very happy life. I ran a marathon a few years ago in Alaska. It's called the Midnight Sun Run. It's the Saturday closest to the longest day of the year. I chose that marathon because I figured I might need 24 hours of daylight to run 26 miles. <laughs> Took two of my kids up there with me, Joe and Evie, night before the race. Hey, kids, this is your dad's craziness. I don't want to impose on your vacation. It's an early go for me. I don't even know where this race is. Don't worry, I'll find it. You guys take it easy, and I'll see you tomorrow afternoon. Oh, it was a, it was a hot day for Anchorage, and there's a lot of hills I hadn't planned on. I'm about mile 13, I hit the wall. Man, I'm sweating like crazy, just barely putting one foot in front of the other, thinking to myself, the most beautiful sight in the world is going to be that finish sign, but it wasn't. It was under the finish sign. Here's Joe, Evie, two of my kids, cheering on the old man when I finally caught my breath. I went to my kids and I said, you just don't know how much it means to your father to have you here, but, but how did you find the finish line? Oh, well, Dad, we shared a cab with a couple of guys from the hotel. They knew where it was. I said, how did they know where it was? Oh, uh, well, Dad, they ran the race. They came back to the hotel. They had breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> What's the message here? You'll never be prisoners of war. I hope and pray none of you face those eight-foot walls. But you will face the eight-inchers, okay? You'll get into those little mental states. That's one of the challenges of life. And so when you get there, what do you do? Well, I'd like to have some good words or a motto or a poem or something for you, but all I can do is quote some folks that I respect a lot. They told me, okay, that if you get into a problem like you've been in a prison camp, or face We certainly thank Captain Plum for his perseverance, uh, for his service to our country, and his continued commitment to living out this story. Uh, sir, you are an inspiration to each of us, and you have modeled what it means to overcome adversity, and I think we can all agree that you are a true patriot. We thank you for sharing those principles and living them out of duty, honor, country, and character above all. And as a token of our appreciation, I'd like to invite to the stage the regimental commander for the 144th Corps of Cadets, Cadet Colonel Grace Gooden, and our Command Sergeant Major Rajon Rose, who are going to present you with a few gifts here at center stage. This is a token of our appreciation, sir. I know that it has been an honor for each of us to hear these fabulous stories of perseverance and from a true American hero. We thank you for being here in attendance today, and you are dismissed. <laughs>